Today we have the pleasure of hearing from Kevin Van Tegum, and he's going to talk on land use and shrinking, shrinking, shrinking rivers. Sorry about that. Um, then we're gonna, he's going to talk for about 30 minutes. We're going to take a break for lunch at 12.30 and come back for a question period at 1 o'clock. So without further ado, let's welcome him. Thank you. It's a, it's a real privilege to be here, and, uh, and I appreciate you all having turned up. Um, so really, uh, the talk today is um, partly framed around the release of a book that I spent probably my whole life imagining and finally ended up writing after I retired. And it goes to, um, it goes to the issue of where our water comes from, how it gets to us, and um, how our use of the landscape affects it. But I wanted to sort of step back and say, you know, when you're talking about the headwaters landscapes that produce all of our water, um, we, we have a habit of talking about them from a multiple use point of view. That's sort of the habit we got into over the last 30 or 40 years and trying to make everybody happy and trying to use this landscape to get as many resources uh, out of it in as many ways as we can. But we should really, I think, when we look at narrow, small pieces of our landscape that are critically important to us, be focused on our strategic needs. And what are the strategic needs that really touch on our headwaters? Obviously, a big one, uh, certainly one that we're very conscious of in southern Alberta, is clean, abundant water, especially in summer when the streams need it the most and we need it the most. Another one would be natural amenities and world-class landscapes. And this really came home to me when I looked at a study that the Calgary Economic uh, um, Development Council did, where they looked at the relocation of head offices to the city of Calgary, and they asked the companies, why did you do that? And the biggest motivator that has made Calgary the head office capital of Canada was the fact that this was a high quality of life, that people could bring professional staff here and they would want to come here and stay here because it was a great place to live. And that goes to the quality of our landscapes. So strategically, in the future, for our economy, in a mobile economy where money and capital moves wherever it wants, we need to keep this place great because that's what keeps people here and keeps people attracted to the place. So I would say natural amenities and world-class landscapes is a really critical issue. One reason that uh, we should be very happy about the protection of the Castle well Wilderness. Another one is biodiversity conservation success stories, both in their own, for their, for, you know, on its own uh, intrinsic value. The fact that bio biological diversity is the product of maybe four and a half billion years of existence. Everything that's here is here by amazing um, se sequence of successes and, 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 and uh, miracles that also, also brought us here. And why would we want to lose any of that? But the other piece is that you know, we have a reputation around the world as a place that covers ducks with bitumen, uh, which is not a great reputation to have when you're actually trying to get some of these, uh, trying, to, trying to get some of our products to global markets that are increasingly critical. We have a social license issue. So really, if we're looking down the road and we're looking at our headwaters, I'm thinking that we should be focused on these things, not on trying to keep a bunch of different people happy based on what they currently want to be doing. So that's where we come to. And that's why I think headwaters conservation is a pretty critical issue, and it's the reason that we produced uh, the, my son, Brian Van Tegum, here. Could you stand up quickly? The photographer and myself. Uh, produced our new book, Headwa Headwaters, Heartwaters, the sources of the Bow River. I'm just going to read a, uh, a couple of little quick segments from it, uh, from actually near the end of the book, because they sort of go to what I'm talking here about. And please excuse me, it's on the Bow River, but everything that I have to say about the Bow River applies to the old man only, it applies to the old man in spades. The foothills and the mountains here are much narrower than farther north. Your, your winter precipitation is often higher, certainly in parts of the castle and the Waterton area. Biodiversity is greater. Everything that's important about keeping the headwaters of the bow alive and healthy is doubly important in the old man. And you, I don't need to talk about water demand down here. The Bow River's water comes almost exclusively from streams that drain the Rocky Mountains and their foothills, but its flow is diminishing. Monitoring on the South Saskatchewan River, of which the bow is a major tributary, shows a 12% decrease in the amount of natural flow over the past three quarters of a century. The Bow and Old Man Rivers are so tapped out that the province of Alberta has denied all applications for new water licenses since 2006. Water is running low in a part of the province that supports more than a third of its population and two thirds of all the irrigated agriculture in, in Canada, and whose population is projected to double within the next quarter century. I wrote that before oil prices tanked, but I think we can still look for some growth. 
Most Albertans alive today have lived through more wet, wet years than dry during a period of unprecedented climate stability. Few remember the devastating multi-year drought of the 1930s. Fewer yet have looked at the historical record compiled by climate scientists that show longer, deeper droughts in the 1700s and 1800s. Even the historic range of climate variability threatens us with extreme drought. But our future climate will not be the same as the past. A slowing jet stream and a warming global climate increase the threat of future droughts. Ironically, even as we face a, a future of water scarcity, spring flooding is becoming more frequent, more damaging, and increasingly costly to recover from. Alberta's water crisis is upon us. So that's sort of the, uh, that goes back to that first strategic priority, water security. I quickly, um, I've already, already acknowledged Brian Van Tegum, uh, who is the photographer for the book, and most of the slides you see are his. There's some lousy ones here, those are mine. Uh, Access Copyright Foundation, who allowed me to get to the archives and do some interviews but with a small research grant, and Rocky Mountain Books, who published our work. And for me, of course, it all started with my childhood with trout. My dad took me fishing in the headwaters, and I'm not going to get into this in too much depth, but that was where I made, formed a connection to these streams that form the sources of our rivers. And, um, and uh, you all know the power of those childhood experiences in shaping who you subsequently, subsequently become. I've spent my entire life working on uh, uh, ecosystem conservation in the headwaters of, of Canada's, uh, Western Canada's drainages and um, realized that if we don't all fall in love with them and understand them, we are going to continue to degrade them and we can't afford to do that. So this is the Bow River, really. Uh, but you don't really see any river here, do you? And I think one of our problems in water management is we tend to look at water management as something that we do to rivers and lakes and reservoirs. You know, uh, historically, the Alberta Environment Water, water uh, Management Division was a bunch of engineers who dammed and diverted rivers. Um, but, you know, in the water cycle, the water isn't always in the river. It, com it, it comes to the river, it flows to the ocean, it goes to the atmosphere, it returns to the land, and it comes to the river again. The most important water management decisions are made in this part of the landscape, the land. And by the time the water's in the river, we've already lost our chance to do a lot of the most important things we can do from a water conservation point of view. So I said mo most of the water comes to us from oceans, the Pacific and Atlantic oceans, and it comes in oceans of air that come inland until they hit these fossilized old ocean beds that we call mountains, and then most of it falls out there as snow. You know, we think about the uh, Bow River's flow as coming from Bow Glacier because was, that's what the geographers tell us. Only 2% of the water in the Bow is from glaciers and virtually none of the water in the Old Man. Most of the water, 80% or more, is from snow. The reason that the Old Man River is flowing today, and it's not really flowing much today, but the reason it's flowing today is because of last winter's snows. That's snow that's flowing through the city of Ep Lethbridge right now. And most of that snow falls in a very narrow band of landscape. Most of Alberta uses water the foothills and the front ranges produce water. If you want more water, that's where you have to look. So if snow is so important, it's important to look at how it gets to us. Snow that falls in the river, of course, becomes part of the river and it's gone by spring. Most of the snow falls and becomes snowpack, and that snowpack gets deeper through the winter, uh, especially at the higher elevations where it's less likely to thaw during the, uh, in, uh, during the warm spells. And in the spring, it melts. It either melts fast or it melts slow, depending on where it is. But a lot of that snow actually falls in the trees and gets stuck in the canopy. And I, I took a course uh, when I was working on the, the book, Heart on Heart Waters, trying to figure out how to get the thing together, uh, where I learned something kind of interesting. About 60% of the snow that falls in trees never makes it into a stream. It goes right back into the atmosphere. Either it's evaporated off the tree, off the tree canopy or when the big warm Chinooks uh, come through and the dry wind comes through from the, from the west and blows it out into the air, it just goes crystalline in the air and vanishes back into water vapor. And maybe it falls in Winnipeg, but it doesn't fall here. So obviously, if we want more snow, which will give us more water, we should cut down all those trees, right? And, and, uh, and I, I did have a moment of panic in the middle of this lecture, thinking, you know, this is not the book I want to write. Uh, where, where are you taking me? But it's a little bit more complicated than that, because the trees are important. In the spring, that snowpack melts fast if it's exposed to the sun and the wind, because the sun and the wind is what does the melting, or it melts slowly if it's sh shaded by trees and if there's wind breaks from the tree canopy. And slow melting is kind of important, because the slower it melts, the, the, the more of it goes into the ground and the less of it runs off overground. 
So yeah, you could do some logging and improve the watershed, but you don't do it by clear cutting. You do it by putting little holes in the forest. Regardless, when the snow melts, whether it goes over overland or underground, it goes downhill following the law of gravity. That's what water does. It's trying to get back to the ocean until it eventually runs out of downhill and it emerges in base flow in the streams or else in little springs along the edges of, of valleys. And once it's back on the surface, it hurries up again. Surface water moves fast, groundwater moves slow. Groundwater, the, you know, the biggest thing we can do if you want a healthy watershed is to make that water as miserable as possible. It wants to get back to the ocean, don't let it. The longer it stays with us, the more good it does. And the higher in the head headwaters it stays with us, the more good it does. So once it comes out, though, it's in a hurry again, and now it's, it's leaving. It's done a lot of good coming down through the soil, but it comes out. But the nice thing is it comes out cold and clean, which is beneficial to us downstream water users. Even when it comes out and started, starts hurrying back to the ocean, there are ways to slow it down. And one of those ways um, is being hardwired into the ecosystem for centuries is beavers. Uh, they have they're little obsessive compulsive rodents that cannot stand the sound of moving water. If they hear it, they have to stop it. And they just work away at stopping it. And they're wonderful at doing that because when they stop it, they store not just the water, but all the silt that was coming off the landscape too. And they back it up and they create these little wetlands. Um, and as long as those wetlands are up in the headwaters, that's great. You know, we spent, I forget what it was, it was like in the, it was close to a billion dollars on this uh, old man dam uh, that many of us know and uh, many, probably many of us value. We spent millions and millions of dollars to build that thing. We still spend thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars maintaining it. These guys do this work for free. But in Alberta, we kill these guys. 12,000 at least per year are killed by, trapper, uh, by trappers, registered trappers. Countless thousands of others, it's not documented anywhere, nobody keeps track of it, killed by problem wildlife officers because they're problems. You know, there are, I would say, fewer problem beavers than there are problem culverts. But we look at plug culverts and say it's a beaver problem rather than, who put that culvert there? In any case, we kill lots of them. And landowners, like myself, when a beaver starts chewing down our poplar trees, we can shoot them because they're not protected by the Wildlife Act. They're, 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 they're considered a pest animal. So here's an animal that does incredible ecosystem services for us for free, and we treat it as something that needs to be killed in as many possible ways as possible. Policy issue. And it's an important one because when I looked at Bateman Creek, which is a tributary of, of Jumping Pound Creek, and uh, talked to the, the researchers there, they were trying to piece together the history of this valley. And they were realizing that these beaver landscapes are being incredible for us from a water management point of view. A lot of these valleys started post-glacier as sort of V-shaped valleys with a very narrow floodplain at the bottom. So when the water comes off in the spring, it comes off on that little floodplain, it goes roaring down the valley and it's gone. It takes a lot of the soil with it. But over the last 10,000 years, beavers have repeatedly dammed these things. And every time a beaver dams a, uh, creates a dam, it stops the silt and it starts building peat, all the vegetation that grows out around the, uh, in, in the wet soils and over top of the water. And increasingly, these things get laid up in the valley until eventually the valley is actually like this instead of like this. This is a wide floodplain. This is a narrow one. We don't like floods. This holds a lot more water during flood season. Not only that, that whole plug in the valley is a giant living sponge. And it's full of water. And that water leaks out slowly. It doesn't come out in the spring, it comes out in the summer, and sometimes it comes out next summer. So we like summer water, and we like clean water, and we like water storage. And here's beavers that have spent 10,000 years building these beautiful sponges that plug up these headwater valleys, and a lot of these beaver dams are empty because they, um, the occupants have been used to, um, ca uh, to produce cash for the trapper who probably got enough money to put a tank of gas in his truck and go back out the next day. It, it, it begs understanding that if water is this important, we would be turning off one of the most important natural processes that brings it to us. And it doesn't just bring us water. These riparian areas are critically important for biodiversity. Up to 80% of the plants and animals in southern Alberta rely for all or part of their life, life cycle on that green part of the landscape that stays green when everything else goes brown. The stuff that's around the water, the stuff that's along the creeks. Well, when a, beaver, when a beaver landscape raises the creek level and broadens the valley, you've got a much bigger riparian area. That's the center of, bi of biodiversity. And we need some biodiversity success stories, don't we? This is incredible grizzly bear habitat you're looking at here. There's probably bears that spend most of the summer in here because it stays green after everything else is no longer quite as palatable. And, you know, grizzly bears are a uh, very emblematic species when it comes to biodiversity uh, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that they're classified as a threatened animal in Alberta. 
whether you agree with that classification or not. Legally, that's what they are. So doing something about uh, keeping these headwaters healthy doesn't just give us better water security. It gives us some of these other stories that we're looking for. And there's another piece, too. It used to be the future was something we looked forward to with enthusiasm. This is where things were going to be better. Our parents, it was all around working hard so their kids get an education, so we could buy a car, pay off the house, because it was going to be a better world to live in because of everybody's work to make the future great. Nowadays, we look at the future and we see climate change, we see population issues, we see resource depletion, and it doesn't look quite as in, uh, promising. But when you start to lose hope about the future, you start to lose motivation. And the more challenging that future is, the more motivation we need. When you can get out to these green, beautiful living places and spend a day here chasing trout down the stream or, or you know, carrying your rifle up the stream or just wandering around out there, these are places that recharge you with hope and recharge you with inspiration. They tell you that good is possible, better is possible. And we need these places simply just to refill our spirits and to send us into the future with a little bit more confidence and a little bit more hope. So there's a lot of reasons why it's important to get it right in the headwaters. I talked about the hydrological cycle and about water management. When I talk about these landscapes, I'm talking about managing the part of the water cycle where we can really make a difference. This is a little piece of, a, of, of the headwaters landscape. This is a tributary of Wipers Creek. The back hill is dry grasses. It's things like rough fescue and hairy wild rye growing in an open pine forest. The foreground is what we call tufted hair grass. It's a bunch of grass that likes to be wet. So most of the year, its roots are wet. What you've got there is the background is where the snow falls. So that's where the snow gets accumulated. Well, it falls all over the whole landscape. A lot of snow falls in that, on that back hill. When it melts in the spring, it melts slowly because there's enough trees there to break up the wind and to provide some shade. And because it melts slowly, it goes into the ground. And it keeps that ground wet for a few weeks. And then most of it's drained downhill, following the rules of gravity, where it eventually hits the bottom part. And it sits there for weeks, months, maybe years growing that tufted hair grass, which is an ice cream plant for grizzly bears. They love this stuff. I've seen them standing up to their bellies in it uh, because it's uh, really nutritious until it goes to seed. So here is this giant sponge in the bottom of this valley holding the snow that's melted slowly off a healthy surrounding landscape, providing excellent bear habitat for an animal that's classified as threatened in the province of Alberta. This is kind of the kind of thing that would be nice for the future. And it's the kind of place that you can probably encourage uh, well-paid professionals to come out and spend some recreational time. People do spend recreational time, not too far away in a similar hair grass meadow, but they don't spend it well. Because of this multi-use um, uh, value for neutral approach that we've taken to our managing our headwaters, we have this kind of mess everywhere out there. This is called a mud bog. It's what happens when people grow up and don't finish growing up and they are able to buy Tonka trucks that they can actually operate on their own. And it's what they call a mud bog. And there's a lot of this happening in the headwaters. When you see this, what you've got is black soil facing the sun, heating up every day, and heat causes evaporation. Compacted tracks going through this stuff, which is like squeezing a sponge, it brings to water, this water to the surface. So now you've got water sitting on top of a black surface. And it's exposed to the, to, to the sun. This is not storing water. This is not feeding grizzly bears, and this is not making Alberta attractive to people that actually have any kind of taste about aesthetic qualities and landscapes. But we have this because we've turned the management of the headwaters over to the wrong agency, and I'm going to get back to that in a minute. The problems become more complex when things add up together. Now, this is a clear cut. You don't do clear cutting in the headwaters of a critical drainage. And the reason you don't is because you get uh, probably about a 40% increase in snowpack and and as has been proven by research to sort of translate into maybe a 12% increase in the water flow. So that's great. And it all comes in the spring. And it all ends up in somebody's basement instead of, instead of watering somebody's farm field or keeping the, the, the creek healthy in the, in the summer. What you want is, if you're going to log it at all, is leave, the, leave it patchy. Actually, I talked to John Pomeroy. He was the hydrologist that uh, led this course I took. And tried to pin them down on, well, you know, you've given us all this stuff about this canopy trapping of, of snow and, and, and all the differences, uh, effects that forestry has. So what would be the right kind of forestry in the headwaters? And you try and get a straight answer out of an academic, you know. Well, you know, we need to do more research on that. Well, you know, there's this and there's that, you know. Um, but eventually I, I pinned him down and he said, well, you know, if you, uh, frankly, I think if it's a critical headwater, your best management regime is natural disturbance. He said, pine beetles, fire, those are the sorts of things that create the kinds of landscape patterns that are probably the most productive from a hydrological point of view. 
And uh, compacted road surfaces and clear cuts are really not the way to go. That was a really nice answer. I felt like, okay, now I can actually finish writing this darn book. Interestingly, that last one was from Spray Lake Sawmills that operates in our headwaters. And this is one of Spray Lake Sawmills' first logged areas in the Spray Lakes drainage. By Alberta forestry standards, this is a failure. This is called insufficiently stocked. By watershed point of view, this is just about perfect. Because you've got a scattering of trees that don't have a lot of snow in the canopy because there's uh, winds able to get in and amongst them. But you have an awful lot of uh, uh, openings, and the openings create snowpack, and there's enough eddies in that forest that actually a lot of the snow that blows off the tree, rather than going into the air, does end up in, this, in the snowpack. And in the spring, the wind can't get at it, and the sun doesn't get at it. So this is actually logging for water, which is, if we're going to do logging at all in the headwater, it's what we should be doing. But as Pomeroy suggested, maybe we should rethink about uh, whether we're logging our headwaters, uh, headwaters at all. A lot of other major uh, population centers of the world protect their headwaters. This is Spray Lake Sawmills uh, over the headwaters of Quirk Creek, which was frightening for me because it's one of my sacred places. Uh, Brian and I uh, chartered a helicopter, so yes, please buy some books on your way out because uh, we'll never recover that much, these <laughs> expense. <laughs> but it was kind of cool. We flew around and we took these pictures, and this is a shot we got of them uh, filming in the uh, of them logging in the headwaters. And this might not be bad because when you look at it in the lower part, uh, there's a lot of scattered trees still in that area that they've logged, and so there's a little bit of shelter, a little bit of windbreak. You look at that little patch on the top left; it's completely in the shade. It's a small patch cut. So there, that will trap snowpack, but it will also interfere with, the, with, with rapid melt, and a lot of that snowpack will go into the ground. That's pretty good. Maybe they're doing some good stuff here, even if they did track up the wetland and put this hard road right through the middle of it. If they take the road out, maybe this is the kind of logging you could have in the headwaters. I'd like to think that, but more likely they just hadn't finished. Oops, I'll skip that one. Because this is what you normally see. And this is the worst possible thing to the headwaters of a critical drainage because this is exposed to the sun and the wind. It's got old skid roads on the line of gravity, so the wonderful channels to run all that fast melting runoff off the d uh, deeper snowpack they accumulate. And when they replant it, they replant it to Alberta standards, which means closed canopy within 20 years. So the first 10 years, you're going to have increased floods, a lot more water, but all in the spring when you don't want it. And then you're going to have a closed canopy which traps snow. And, and now you go into a period of time where you have, actually have less water. So it's like we figured out how to log in the worst possible way and we made that the rules. A lot of loggers will tell you that fire, uh, fire is, the, is the dangerous alternative and that logging replaces fire. Well, if you look at this burned area, and th don't blame Brian for this photograph, this is mine. Um, this is photographed actually over in British Columbia, but this is an area that was burned in Kootenai National Park. Lots of shade, lots of windbreak, and yet, lots of snowpack accumulation. For the first few years after fire, yeah, you get rapid runoff because you've got these black trunks melting the snowpack every spring. But after that, the bark flakes off and you've got this silvery gray stem standing there and a lot of snow falling in between them. But you've got no roads to, to, to channel the runoff off the landscape and you've got lots of shade and you've got a good windbreak. Fire is actually a good thing. A mountain pine beetle is a great thing when it comes from wa to a water point of view. The other piece that we've got here is this one. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think the pictures tell the story. This is everywhere. And this is absolutely unforgivable. This society, to tolerate this, I don't know what in heck is wrong with us. Because this is the worst possible way you can treat wildlife habitat, the worst possible way you can treat streams, and the worst possible way you can treat your, wa fu your water future. All of this stuff is moving soil and water off the landscape faster than it has ever drained before. The one on the top left, uh, sorry, the top right, I want to point out in particular, this is a gully that formed after the 2013 flood. That was a seismic cut line that was closed to off-road motor vehicles. It was vegetated when I was a kid. We used to walk in on these cut lines to go fishing. And they, they grew back vegetated. They were still not pretty, but they were, they were sort of trying to recover. And then the off-roaders discovered them in the 70s and 80s. They became unvegetated. And of course, unvegetated ground is very vulnerable to rain. And when heavy rains hit this in 2013, it took out not just the surface, but it cut this, 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 this gully in here, which means that all that nice rain that could have been useful, but it's been stored in the soil, roist off the landscape. But now, because that entire landscape is a reservoir, it all holds water for part of the year, now the, the bottom of the gully is the top of the water table. All the soil on both sides of this thing is draining into the gully every, early every summer until it's drained down to the bottom of the gully, which is out of the root zone. 
you know, we worry about forest fires, we worry about pine beetles, we worry about drying out forests. Well, you know, you take the water out of the root zone, you're going to have an issue here. And those trees have got an awful lot of important functions, not the least of which is protecting our watershed. So slicing these kinds of holes in the landscape impacts us in multiple ways, not just a few ways. Uh, and every one of those ways is harmful for the watershed. Thank you. Which brings me to my second reading, towards the end of the, my, um, my preachy chapter here. When we are worried about water security, our habit, certainly in southern Alberta, is to look for the next dam site. Dams don't give you more water. They store the water you've already got. You've still got the budget you've got. The only way to get more water is to look at your management of the headwaters. And not only do, do they <laughs> not give you more water, they cost you water. Uh, Lake Diefenbaker, evaporation takes more water from Lake Diefenbaker, the reservoir between the Gardner Dam than all its human users, even though the reservoir serves more than three quarters of Saskatchewan's population. So we're not getting more water, we're actually getting less water. We just, you know, it's nice, we, we, we spread it out to the season when we could use it, that's he helpful, but we're not improving our water security. Dams waste water, they devastate rivers, destroy native fish stocks and cost a fortune to build and maintain. And even the largest of dams hold back only a small portion of the available spring runoff. A far more elegant solution to the water supply conundrum is simply to store the water in the headwaters landscape itself in forests, fens, beaver meadows, soil, and their underlying groundwater aquifers. That's what the headwater landscape is, a living reservoir capable of storing far more, wa more water than any number of man-made dams ever could. And the advantage of storing water in the landscape is that it's not just downstream water users who benefit. Everything does. Trout, creeks, anglers, bears, elk, otters, songbirds, hikers, hunters, trees, and waterfowl. The solution to Alberta's water challenge second century is to reverse the mistakes of our first century when pretty much everything we did in the headwaters reduced their capacity to produce abundant clean water. To an objective viewer, in fact, it might look like we spent the last few decades trying to drain the high country as fast as possible rather than steward its water holding capacity. 